So the game we're looking at here is Conquest of Pangea. Um, this one seems to have not gotten a lot of popularity. Reasonable. Uh, but I thought it was an interesting idea. Now to me, I put this in the same category as I will put my other kind of prehistoric, you know, uh, species growth type games. Things like American megafauna that I have up here, uh, Erland even, Quirks, uh, Toronto X, all that stuff. None of them really capture the whole picture. And I just picked this one up. This is going to be a first look for this, but not quite because I played it once opposed before this. Um, this is more of a puzzle game than most of those are. This is more closer to a pure strategy type game, even though it's not pure strategy. There's a significant amount of luck in it. But all the same, it's not a game where you're necessarily watching uh, a species growing and surviving in the same sort of way as you are in Quirks or in uh, American Megafauna. In Erland, it's probably closer to out of the pile uh, that I mentioned. However, it does contain some interesting concepts which have to do with the floating and drifting of the continents. It doesn't try to really simulate that, though. It's just, it's a mechanism within the game, unfortunately. I was hoping to capture something that I could add to those other games and make them work a little better. Uh, this is not the game to do that way. All right, let's look at what the rules are like. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to be playing four players, but uh, because there are four players available for it. But what happens is you set the game up by drawing these time cards, and it shows you a continent, and this will be kind of this purplish pink thing, and you immediately drop one of your little critters in a space there. I think you're supposed to take an empty space at the first part. And then you reach into this other bag here. There's bags for... These are really nice canvas bags that come with the game, by the way. Uh, there's bags for all, all the different sets of pieces. And then in this one, and this is really hard to do one-handed. I'll just grab the top one. You get a type of terrain. And in this case, it's hills. Now, I dominate this area because I'm the only creature there. So what I do is I look over here, and I should have some decks of these. And I will end up getting a Hills Dominance card for that. Great. That sounds good. And that's actually how you're going to score points in the game, is off these points that are here. Those are also your limits and a number uh, and the cost to enter the area and all kinds of cool stuff. All right. Um, so each player is going to be drawing, and some of these are zeros, which means that wherever they placed, they fail, but they get their piece back um, to their supply. Which, the way it's stated but here, has helps me to define that wherever it doesn't say you get it back to your supply, it goes back into the dead pile, or the box, or whatever. Which is, uh, there's a very quick reduction of pieces in this game. Which, as you get towards the end of the game, people are having very few pieces to move. They've got them all on the board, and they've lost a few, quite a few of them. At least that's the experience I've had. All right, so let's go on. Um, once the entire board is filled, and everybody's gotten uh, pieces down, then you go to the main play of the game. And what's going to happen here, and you'll see this better when we start playing, but I'm going to explain it very briefly. You have a few options. You have the option to grow, to expand, or to invade. Now, growth is the basic. I got a piece somewhere. I can put another piece there, and I've got to put it at the bottom of a stack. This is important. If I had another color out already, I would explain this. But if somebody else had drawn in this area and there was nowhere they could go safely, they can go underneath a piece up to the limit. So this area can hold a total of three pieces. So by expanding, 
as an example. I can put a second piece there. Great. Uh, or by growing. By expanding, if I have two pieces somewhere, I can do the same thing. Put a piece at the bottom of the stack in some other area. Now these are all going to already have terrain and they're going to have a number, a limit number on them. That limit number tells me what number I have to fight if I'm going to go into. And I can only fight against the dominant player there, which is kind of a, a weird situation. So, as long as I'm either growing my own stack or expanding into an adjacent area that I have at least, I, I have to have at least two pieces next to it, a, a, a single stack with two pieces next to it, in order to do this, as long as I'm doing either of them, I've got to stay within the limit of the territory, i.e. here, I couldn't, no one could expand into me if I have three pieces here, because that fully fills the area. Now, the other option is invasion, which is to attack an area, and it follows the same kind of rules. You have to use a growth or a... Uh, Okay, sorry about that. You have to do a growth or a um, expansion type of action in order to invade. And you're just placing um, a piece to battle the dominant player. Now, Blue couldn't invade this space, not only because he's the only player there, but because he's the dominant player. So I'm going to need another color set, which I'll spill out for this. So now, one thing that I failed to tell you, when you do expand into an area, you have to a price. Now at the beginning of each of your turns, and let's go through the whole turn reminder card because honestly the rules are set out less well than the turn reminder turn. So on your turn, the first thing you do is you grab five of these little fish stones and if you have any power cards that are flipped over to indicate that they've been used, then you flip them back up and it indicates that you can reuse them for this turn. Okay, then the next thing you do is you move your leader token. Now, the leader token is something you get, let's see where that's explained, all the way over here, at the end of it, whatever turn you have in which you initially dominate three or more adjacent areas. And at that point, you can place it on any of those three areas. When you move your leader token, you can move him one space to habitable areas. Volcanoes and sulfur are not habitable. And he then creates sort of a free growth type thing at the bottom of that area, if there's room for it. He can't cause a battle that way. You have to have pieces in your stock for that to happen. So it gives you a quick jump on how many how you get your pieces on the board early, which may not necessarily be entirely to your advantage. He's going to give you other advantages too, uh, which is he can give you two bonus to an attack, and we'll touch that in a moment. If you don't want to move him, if you don't want to grow, you can move him two or three spaces, or you can use a raft in order to move him if you have a raft. You probably don't, well, you don't at the beginning of the game. All right, so let's look at uh, the rest. Okay, after you move the leader, you can add the free population token. And now you're gonna have to pay for growth, expansion, and migration. And that's this situation. Let's say I don't have my leader on the board and I want to grow here, well, I have to pay three points to do so. I can use three of my five stones to pay for that. That means I only have two left for another growth or expansion. Alternatively, if I have cards, and some of these come to you through play, and these are handed out kind of randomly, if I have, and they also have a number on them, I can expend them for their number. If they have a little circle, I turn them face down, and I get them back at the beginning of my next turn. If alternatively they have an arrow, 
I have to discard them when I play them. And they actually go at the bottom of the power deck. Okay. So I can use those numbers to pay my costs along with the stones. And in fact, some of these, these are special powers, and I'll explain how you get either of the powers in a moment, um, are worth more in different places. So this is worth two in general, but three if I'm evading, growing, or expanding in the mountains. It's got an additional advantage to defending in the mountains. Each one's good at getting into its own type of territory which is kind of not what you want, but it's cool. These also can have special abilities. In fact, every one of these does. Uh, this one is that it's got higher numbers. But for example, this one says you can avoid loss from a volcano. If a volcano comes up, you can flip it down, and you can avoid it. If it's already flipped down, you can't use it for that. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, so invading and paying for a battle. Invading works very much like just expanding. The base idea is there. So let's say this is our situation. And blue wanted to grow here, but they can't because there's already three pieces. Well, they have to pay, if they want to attack, they have to pay the three stones that they would have to spend to grow. But now they're doing an attack, and this allows for a slightly different um, mechanics in order to uh, drive the, the competition between two species there. So Blue's allowed to pick up their cards that they have available, their stones. They can commit more stones if they want. They can commit cards face down if they want. Any amount, really, it looks like. Um, and then the defender has the option to defend what he's got. And he can do that with his own cards. He doesn't have any stones. The attacker had to pay enough to make the attack. The defender is gonna, knows that he has to beat the attacker's attack value. And he knows a minimum by the stones or the cost, or whatever, of what the attacker's committing to this. So then the defender can play additional cards to try to overcome what the attackers put out. They both flip them over. If the attacker has won, the defending piece is removed from the game, and the attacking piece goes on the top. The attackers gain dominance. I'll explain what happens when you gain dominance in a little bit. That's a good thing uh, in general. Well, among other things, you'd get the card. So if Tan owned this Hills card, it would now go over to Blue. If you lose completely an area and you had dominance in it, the card goes up here because there's a certain number of these cards that are in play for any given game that are determined by the random distribution of these things, how they come out at the beginning of the game. All right. So, now, let's say the defender, the attacker fails to overcome the defender. Well, the attacker now has the option to either surrender, in which case his piece is lost from the game forever, or to play one more card face down, and then the defender can play one more card face down. They flip up, and then the new total, including all the other values, is compared and the attacker still has to beat the defender if he does he wins if he doesn't he loses and his piece is destroyed one person is losing their piece permanently in every battle now here's the question later in the game there are time events that destroy pieces now my take on the rules is that these suckers also destroy them permanently. So very quickly you start seeing this deterioration in the total number of pieces you have available. You're adding more to the board but you're losing them through conflict and through the time events. And that's kind of an interesting uh, dynamic that's going on there. Alright, let's look at the rest of the turn. Um, 
So after a battle, then we go to ending your turn, and you discard whatever used power cards you had with this, and you return these guys to your hand, but they're face down. You claim new power cards and dominance cards. So here's the deal with these. When you gain dominance in an area in which, a type of area, in which you have two or more of that area, during your turn, you get one of these cards. And you get it for the right terrain. So for example, in Hills, you would get the Hills card. And this, and it indicates it here, gives you a number of different, it gives you different values when it's used as a card, either in combat or uh, otherwise. Um, and it also has a special ability you could trigger, which is, for example, in this case, avoiding loss from earthquakes, which is cool. Your whole species is able to take that advantage of that trait, but you have to use the card to do it. You can only ever have one of each of these in the game, though. You hold on to it as long as you have any of that terrain, but once you lose dominance in all of that terrain, the card's discarded and you'll have to get dominance in two of them again to gain it again. Alright. Uh, these other cards, you get one of them if you grow or migrate, I think. No, if you, if you just grow. Let's see. Yeah, you earn one if you grow. You earn two if you expand, invade, or take an ocean voyage with a raft, or migrate. All kinds of different options that can get you two. Now here's the problem. The rules say you get one or two each turn. It's possible you might not do anything. We had a long period in a two-player game where one or both of us weren't doing anything. But it also, you know, so it says you get one or two per turn, but it also says you get one if you grow and two if you do these other things. And it doesn't say anything about if you do nothing. We kind of did a rule, house rule, you get one if you do nothing. It's as though you grow. Um, that helps destabilize uh, situations that are forced in, into a static uh, situation. But... You can gain an advantage in this game fairly quickly, uh, where you have a pile of cards. And especially in the two-player game, it's very hard to convince yourself to attack somebody with a lot of stuff. At least it was for my wife. I might have been able to pull it off. Uh, claim, you're right. Okay, then you draw a time card and follow its instructions. Now these get reshuffled after the initial setup. It's going to have some instructions that you have some, as the drawer, have some ability to um, affect. Like you might make choices of who's destroyed and who's not. And then, if you've added up a sum of uh, time cards in the timeline that's 25 or greater, a continent breaks off. In particular, the continent listed will break off if it can. And all the continents break off from Africa, and they just become no longer connected. If this one had already broken off, well, we'd go down the list uh, of, of continents to see which one actually did. Um, it's possible to get ocean rafts. They allow you to do this kind of movement from one, con from one coastal area to another. Are there any non-coastal areas? Well, there are. For example, this is not a coastal area, I think, at the beginning of the game. This certainly is not. Um, but once all the continents break up, everything's coastal. And the game continues. Um, just make sure. Yeah. So after you draw the time card, you pass these suckers to the next player. And they get their turn to expand and grow and such. And the game continues uh, with people fighting over these different dominance cards. Until... All six of the continents have broken away from Africa. Africa never breaks away. When that happens, the game ends immediately. Um, the person with the most of these dominance points wins the game. And 
there are some tiebreakers based on the number of yellow power cards and then white power cards. Those seem pretty minor. I'm going to load this up and get started on this sucker.